Computer, with your help, we'll be able to stop all wars, end world hunger, create more leisure time. Finally, the results I've been waiting for. Well, wait a minute. This, this can't be right. It's... Bill Nye the Science Guy. Property of matter. T minus seven seconds. the science guy. This is a switch. It has two positions: off or on, black or red. It's like a door. It's either closed or open. Doors are like that. And so are switches. Now, here are four switches. To get this door to open, they have to be in the right position. You can think of the position of the switches like being information. Information you need to get the door to open. Now, here are eight switches. That would be a lot of information. But I know the combo. Now, see, even though it's a lot of information, each switch is still either black or red, either off or on. And this is how computers work. See, humans invented computers to move and store information with switches. Take a look at this. It's our computer simulation switchboard of science. It has a whole bunch of switches. Uh-huh. And each switch controls one of these lights. Now, switches can carry information, like one if by land, two if by sea, or uh, this means uh, Nobody's coming. Anyway, the more switches we have, the more information we can move around. Like this would be the letter A. A, A. See? Now the information got sent from these switches over to these lights. Computers not only move information around, they can store it. If I throw this switch, the A is gone, but the information is still there in the switches. Now, the computers that you and I use every day have billions of switches. How many? Billions of switches. How many? Billions of switches. Okay. And they're too small to see with just your eye. They're electronic, but they work something like this. They use switches to store information and move it. <laughs> not bad, eh? A, A. I mean, uh, not bad. A. This switch, you're there plugging cables and setting switches according to written instructions. This switch, several people are doing both numerical setup and control programming on the computing units. The program one plugged in cables and set switches. Switch, 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 switch. Switches. This is an abacus, an early computing machine. You hold it like this. Now humans have 10 fingers, five on each hand, and an abacus has beads, five on each stick. You count like this. One, two, three, four, five. That's one hand. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's two hands. Now to get to a number bigger than ten, you need a third hand. You have to add another stick. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and so on. Now there's nothing in a computer that can count to ten the way you can with your hands. Computers have switches, and each switch can only count to one. Each switch is either zero or one. Zero or one. Then to count to a number bigger than one, we have to go to another stick. This one is zero or two. Then to count, we go two plus one is three. Zero or four. Four plus one is five. Six, seven, then eight. With enough switches, billions of switches. Huh? Billions of switches. Okay. Billions of switches. Careful. You can count into the billions. Billions. See, it's just another way of counting. It's called binary. Binary means two, like a bicycle has two wheels. Now, each piece of information that's either zero or one is called a bit, bit. So computers count with binary bits. Each switch is either one or zero, zero or one, on or off. Yes. Oh, you know, I think I hurt my arm. Johnny wanted to hook up to the most powerful computer in the world. 
Unfortunately, his modem dialed the wrong number. Who can tell me what the capital of Ohio is? And that's why he became... Johnny? Johnny Moronic. Six pack of cola, 199. Five cans of corn niblets, 99 cents. Gum, 75 cents. Cotton balls, 199. Johnny Moronic. Hi, Mr. Vice President. What are you working on? Hi, Bill. Uh, actually, I'm watching a lightning storm on Jupiter. Oh, there's no telescope or anything. You're just sitting in your office. Right. I'm using the power of the internet to access the World Wide Web on my laptop computer, where I can see the luminous electric discharge in Jupiter's atmosphere that produces lightning. God, there's so much here. It's so fast. It is, but as you know, the speed of any electrical signal is limited by the capacitance of its substrates. Yeah, you're right. Speed is, is always a constraint, but man, it just looks like you could do everything. Not quite everything. I am vice president. Huh. This computer is a form of hardware. It's a very powerful tool, but without software, it wouldn't be worth anything at all. See, software is a list of instructions that tells the computer how to run its millions of switches, like how to turn on and how to turn off. This videotape is another form of software. Without it, your VCR isn't worth anything. You need hardware, the VCR, and software, the tape, to make it work. What's on this film is software, too. The projector is the hardware. You would see a blank screen if you ran the projector without the software. Lights, action. <laughs> Not bad, huh? <laughs> it's a player piano. It's a lot like a computer. It has software. It converts information from one form to another. In this case, the holes in this paper roll get converted to musical notes. See, as the holes go by, they tell the piano whether to play a note or not. They're like switches in a computer. It's also a lot like a compact disc. stores information too, but instead of storing it on a paper tape with holes, stores it on a plastic disc with billions of pits. You can't see them without an electron microscope. And there's way more information here than what you need to control 88 keys and a couple of pedals. Now a CD could control thousands of pianos at the same time. And it doesn't have to be a piano. We can play anything we want. Computers convert information from one form to another. Like these barcodes get converted into names and prices. Each dark bar is like a switch. The laser reads the bars and sends that pattern to the store's computer, which takes that message of light and dark spaces and matches it to a product and a price. Then the store's computer sends a new message to the cash register. Then a computer in the cash register converts that information back into names and prices. Now the information about the price and any special the store might be having is stored in the computer, not on the package itself. And store managers can use this information to make sure they keep the right items in stock. <laughs> How are we doing there? One million dollars. Um. Computers store information. Plenty of it. Please consider the following. You might not have ever thought about it, but a library is a place where we store information. Shh. Letters and words on pages are a way, well, a great way to store information. Now we can put the information in books and put the books on shelves, or we can take the books down, open them up, and find a recipe for uh, pizza. Shh. In a library or at home, 
you have a table big enough, you can have a lot of books open at once. You don't have to go back to the shelf to get a book to read it. And you can scan from one book to another, just like that. A lot of the computers that you and I use are set up like an open book. They have a part of their memory called RAM. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. We call it random because you can get to any part of the memory without having to start at the same place each time. RAM is like an open book on a table. Now notice that in a library it wouldn't be much use to have all the books open at once. You couldn't find things or skip over things. And open books take up a lot of room. Most of the information in a library is on the shelves, and most of the information in a computer is on the hard drive, or compact disk. You can't make use of this information until it's in RAM, the same way you can't make use of the information in a book until you take it off the shelf and open it. Ah, well, thank you for joining me. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. It's the EdZac computer. No more need for tedious pencil and paper, as computing power never before seen in the history of man. Hundreds of calculations an hour on thousands of switches. Ever wonder how a computer sorts through huge amounts of information? You can see how a computer works by making a model. I've got some 3x5 cards like these, and I cut a corner off at an angle. That way, I'll know if my cards are facing the same way or not. Then I gave each color a tab in a different spot along the top. Then punch a hole in the center of each tab. Now mix up your cards. These cards are like pages of information stored on your computer. Now, if I want to get all the green cards out, I don't need to look at every single card and sort them out one by one. I can just take a paper clip and hook the green ones wow. all at once. Pretty cool, huh? That's how a computer sorts things, too. It looks for a marker or a tab and only pulls out the information you need. <laughs> this guy's funny. B8. Ah, you sunk my aircraft carrier. You beat me again. Seven out of seven, not bad. Computer screens have a grid like this game. For a computer to make a picture, it needs a program to tell it how to light up the points on the grid. You want to play again? Come on. One more. <clears throat> Very fun. Fine. It's like making a picture, just using colored pegs. I'm mean, sure by itself, the grid doesn't really look like much, right? Well, if we add a program, and you fill in the colored dots on the grid. See, and you make something cool. It's a flower. It's like a computer screen. Either the point is off, or it's on. Computers make pictures the same way, see, by turning colored dots off and on on a grid. Off and on, zero and one. One computer can be a powerful thing, but a whole bunch of computers hooked together can be even more useful and powerful. We often hook them together in what's called a network. A network is like a net, and the computers are like knots. Now notice that there are many different paths you can take to get from one computer, one knot in the net, to another, and they're all tied together at the same time. See, that's the key to a computer network. It's like being able to go from Atlanta to Los Angeles without always having to go through St. Louis. You could take a different route every time you made the trip. The freeway exits would come up in a different order, and they're all connected at once. When you're using it, you're able to get over, under, around, through, and to places without having to stop in between. So you can link your one computer to the entire globe. You can hook up with some guy's spinning head in Seattle, if that's what you were into. See, you're driving on the electronic super high. Huh? Got <laughs> Networks are amazing. I mean, the realism that we're able to achieve now with all the circuits hooked together is like a virtual pie in the face.
plugged in as a community computer center, and basically it's uh, here to help the community learn how to use computers and uh, help me use them as a tool. Being able to work with the computers and have people that will teach you when you don't know what you're doing and maybe take you through it, that's very cool because when you get out into the job world, you'll have to know those type of skills. Plugged In Enterprises is a business run by teens. We build web pages for uh, people or businesses. Web pages are from the World Wide Web and they're easy to access from any web browser. We just make them look as nice as we can. We build them to their specifications. We put it little codes and little tags into the computer to make it look like this, to make an image show up or to make words show up in a certain place. What is that, pi at plugin.org? Yes, pi at plugin.org. The internet is cool because it links everybody in through information, and that's one common thing that we all have is we all want information, we all need information. I believe everybody should get plugged in. Now, open the pod bay doors. I'm sorry, Bill. I'm afraid I can't do that. I confidently expect within 10 or 15 years, we will find emerging from the laboratory something not too far from the robot of science fiction fame. Some scientists are trying to make computers that work something like the brains of insects. The robot. Suppose we took a simple instruction. A thinking machine. If there's something in front of you, don't run into it. <laughs> see, for you and me, that'd be easy. We just open our eyes and see an object and, and not walk toward it. But to get a robot to do the same thing is a pretty complicated task. Uh, we must make the computer aware of the same rules. Rule, rule, rule. Took scientists a long time to make this robot. That's a computer in it that uses sound waves to sense what's in front of it and trace its path. Artificial, artificial, artificial intelligence. Now the reason it's easy for us is that human brains are so much more complex than even the fanciest computers and robots. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> We had a lot of fun working on this program, but we're not just playing games. Computers! These planes are unstable. We couldn't fly them without computers. Computers make them maneuverable, so we can keep control no matter what's going on. <laughs> Humans have figured out how much the plane weighs, how fast it's going, how the angle of attack is, how fast it might be turning, the density of the air and everything to figure out how to maneuver the plane with just a little bit of thinking by the pilot. It's all done with computers. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Hey, not that bad. Science! 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 The first computer that could do math problems way faster than humans with big numbers was huge. It took up a whole room, over 100 square meters, and it was called the ENIAC. The Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. It could do math problems fast, but it was big, heavy, and hot. In the mid-1960s, the computer in this spacecraft was the most powerful computing machine possible for its size. It weighed about a ten-thousandth as much as the ENIAC, and it used about a ten-thousandth as much electricity. We made all those changes in just 15 years. This thing was about as powerful as a calculator is today. Not that bad, not that bad, not that bad. <laughs> right now in the lab, it's the mid-1990s, and a computer like this one is about a billion, trillion, trillion times quicker, billion, trillion, trillion times quicker than the very first electronic machines. Now, in a sense, all of our computers are like that. Computers like this one, or this. But in the future, 
Computers will be smaller, cheaper, and faster. In the 21st century, they'll be even more a part of our lives than they are today. They'll be everywhere. Just watch. <laughs> See that just... One zero 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 one. One zero 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 one. One zero one one. One one zero one one. One zero one one zero one. No computers ought to no computers. Computers are just tools that convert information. You ought to know by now, cause they're all across the nation. Ought to know. our show. Thanks for drag and dropping by. If you'll excuse me, I've got some object-oriented search algorithms to debug. See ya! <laughs> Produced in association with the National Science Foundation.